egotistical, so unpredictable Here on the SNL Network Yes, that is right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Saturday Night Network. So excited to be with you today for another edition of SNL Stories. This is our podcast series where we speak to SNL alumni about their time at Saturday Night Live and get the real scoop, some really interesting stories from the history of the show. So many great characters and cast members that have been with us and members of the crew as well. So really enjoying this series and the man who makes it all happen with us. It is James Stevens. James, how are you doing? I don't know if I'm the man that makes it happen, but I'm I'm well, John. It's good to be here. It's been a very, very busy fall, and I'm just glad that we are, uh, you and I mentioned earlier today, now connecting. Uh, I don't know that it's slowing down any, but I'm traveling less, so I'm I'm home more, and I'm excited for uh, our, our our discussion today. Yeah, very excited to have you back on with us, James, and for our talk today. And let me introduce our guest that we have with us today. And you have heard from this guy previously just a few months back when we inter- interviewed him prior to the Blues Brothers convention. It is the legendary Tom Bones of Malone. Tom, how are you? Feeling great. Uh, thanks for having me on the program. Of course. Very happy to have you. You told us some great stories a few months ago, so can't wait to get into some more tonight. And I know you have uh, a good friend of yours with us and somebody that we are so thrilled to have on our podcast. Uh, What a legend. It is Paul Schaefer. Paul, how are you? Well, it's great to be here. I almost didn't make it. But uh, technology being uh, what it is, and we hope that it will continue to be so, it's nice to be with you. It's very nice to be with you as well. We have so many fun questions for you today, so I'm excited to dive right in. But of course, James, I know that one of the things we wanted to do was find out about how this Blues Brothers convention went with James. You were actually there, right? I I was there, and Tom, uh, it was such a pleasure to meet the incomparable Sally, uh, Tom's Tom's wife, of course. Um, And I'll tell you, uh, not only was it great to be there around so much great blues music, and the Blues Brothers uh, themselves. But to see Tom with Dan and Jim, you know, picking up, you know, I don't know how many, how long it, Tom it had been since the last time you saw those guys, but just like to see them and other members of the band just like a fly on the wall and taking some photos, that was just uh, super fun uh, to, to see and witness. Um, I shared some pictures with you as I was uh, trying to capture it in real time. But uh, what, what was that like for you? Oh, it was uh, uh, a little little uh, deja vu. They're remembering uh, our past times and, and past fun that we had. It's been a long time since I hung out with either one of those guys. And so, uh, and you know, they have this band uh, uh, that's quite good of uh, local L.A. guys. Uh, one guy I went to college with at North Texas State, uh, Daryl Leonard, the, the trumpet player, horn arranger. Um, but uh, I just had a great time. Uh, the whole The whole weekend was really fun. And uh, hanging out with James was fun, too. We got him on the band bus going into the gig, and uh, we just uh, hung out the whole weekend. Uh, yeah, I asked. I said, well, because they were going to do a sound check. I said, well, do you need uh, do you need another roadie or something? He goes, just get on the bus. And I got on the bus with all those guys. It was fantastic. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, Paul, but I heard, uh, anyway, that weekend, uh, you would have maybe been there, but it sounded, is it true that you were doing something with Marty Short that weekend? Marty Short and Steve Martin uh, have been touring together. Uh, they're, they're, they got a big hit when they, they perform did. live. And they, uh, they usually use them um, on piano. Steve brings a whole bluegrass band with him. Marty's just one piano player. His pianist, uh, Jeff Babko, uh, couldn't make it that weekend. And so I got to fill in. I've, done, I've filled in a couple of times for him. Uh, but they are hilarious and... They don't stop talking. I mean, we did three shows in a row that, that very weekend. Or, of course, I would have been there with you guys in Joliet. Uh, I was going to say, these two guys don't stop talking about the show. And from morning till night, as soon as they get up and we're on the first plane, you know, to get to the first plane, they're talking about redoing it. Let's change this. Maybe if you say that line, I come back with a different line. And all day long, they analyze the show and change it. And then by 7 p.m., a guy comes, we're doing it exactly the same tonight. And each night... <laughs> Each night, it's a, it's a, each night, it was a repeat of that. Anyway, um, a lot of fun. Uh, we, one of the places we played was Wolf Trap outside of Washington, D.C. 80 degrees on stage. Uh, Marty just knocking himself out throughout, you know. 
prosthetics and then he's Jiminy Glick with a big wet huge fat suit and then he's jumping and he's dancing and he's he's stepping on the keys of the piano ah, he steps right on my finger I'm telling you it's uh it's nonstop. it sounds like you guys had just as good a time it sounds absolutely incredible so you know, Tom, when we were last on with us, we covered a lot about your history and how you got into Saturday Night Live and, and started becoming, you know, an original member of the band. But we definitely want to hear that from Paul as well tonight because we haven't heard uh, your origin story with SNL, Paul. So can you just tell us how you ended up getting onto Saturday Night Live and part of the original band that was there? Uh, well, I'm from Canada. Um, Northern. Who, who said same? James? Maybe I'm from Montreal. I'm from oh, Montreal. You, John, where are you from? Oh, from Montreal. Well, that's yes. no problem. No, no, just kidding <laughs> about that. I'll speak French from now on. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Merci. Bon, bon, bon nuit. Bon, uh, bonsoir, uh, Monsieur, Monsieur. Um, I um, let's see. How did this this all start? Well, I came to New York. Um, First of all, I did a show up there in 1972, Godspell, a New York show that had a Canadian company. And that once I did that, I was in theater up there and I, I got involved in another show. I started getting calls to do shows. And in one show, the producer, who was a Canadian guy, who was a leader of a band called Lighthouse up there. Um, and he said, could you use, I want you to use my, friend from Lighthouse on the saxophone, Howard Shore. We came in, he was terrific, and we hit it off. Then, next thing I know, because of my connection with Godspell and Steve Schwartz, a composer, I moved to New York, and I, I was playing on Broadway, and then I got a call from Howard. This is a year later. Remember me from that show? I'm coming to New York now with Lauren Michaels. We're going to do a new show called Saturday Night. At that time, it wasn't even Saturday Night Live, because... Howard Cosell had a show called Saturday Night Live. Eyes was just called NBC Saturday Night. And he says, and I know you're already there doing a Broadway show. You know, I want you to be the keyboard player. You already know a lot of the people. Like uh, Gilda was, uh, was not Canadian, but was up there at the time. And then got hired down here for SNL. Danny Aykroyd was Canadian. I had met Belushi already through Billy Murray's uh, older brother, Brian Doyle Murray. Long story. Anyway, he hired me, and I was sort of a ringer. Uh, uh, Tom may have told you that a guy named um, Howard Johnson, the late great Howard Johnson, uh, tuba and baritone player of note, he was the first contractor. Uh, I don't know if he hired Tom. I, have, I think he called Tom for the gig. But I was a ringer from Canada that Howard placed me in there. But luckily, I, I, you know, we all got along. And um, we had an awful lot of fun as the house band on Saturday Night Live. You can, you can just imagine as they were developing that stuff, you know, we were developing along, along with them. So that's how I came to, to be on Saturday Night Live. Can I do, yeah, can I do a quick follow-up? You know, it occurred to me, um, you know, Howard Shore, obviously, saxophone player and, and you know, sort of front of the band there. Uh, and we've seen, you know, almost now 50 years of the opening theme and the closing theme. And I know both of you, Tom and Paul, having, uh, you know, your fingerprints on on uh, taking Howard's original vision, but, you know, kind of, you know, doing different uh, arrangements of it over time. But I guess the saxophone, especially in the in those themes, being the, the lead voice, uh, right? I mean, that's the one thing that's sort of tried and true. Yeah. And uh, and that between Howard and Lorne, the producer, they came up with that. I think that um, you know, Howard was a fan of Junior Walker, and maybe he turned Lorne under Junior Walker. Whatever it was, Lorne dug that too. And between them, they said, we're going to have a saxophone lead. Uh, the other innovation, though, was that the melody that the sax played was not going to be written out. And this I, uh, go, goes to Howard. You know, he'll improvise it every night uh, against the changes that Howard did write. And it was a great, you know, both the opening and closing themes were the same, improvised by the tenor player. And so it didn't get stale. It, 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 it prevented it from getting stale. A guy could improvise a new melody every week, you know, and it was his, his improv solo. And I sort of, I picked that up from 
Howard. And when I, Letterman started, I wrote my theme the same way, leaving a lot of it uh, to be improvised uh, on the day. And another then they got amazing on. theme. Another amazing theme. Though. Why? Thank you. Thing about the Letterman theme, though, they kept they're so paranoid about people flipping over to Leno that they kept <laughs> shortening the film. And so I had to keep shortening my theme. You got a new version. You got to take 10 seconds out. Oh, my God. What am I going to, you know, and I figure out a new 10. Then they take another five out, you know. So by the time I think we were off the air, that no longer any room for improvisation. But uh, it started out that way. Because correct me if I'm wrong. I find this fascinating. Both Letterman and, and SNL, right? I mean, you're playing the music live and there's a. There's a film that's running, right? It's the it's the pre-tape of the of the thing that you're you're kind of playing in time with, and uh, yeah, yeah. And in both cases, we didn't sync up. We, we didn't play a click and try to really sync up. It just you know as close close enough. Um, when we started Letterman, I came in after they had been on the morning for a while. Uh, they were they did a very hip morning. show live in the morning, a little too hip for the for the hour, you know. Uh, but on that show, Michael McDonald had written them a theme and pre-recorded it. And so they would do a, you would listen to Michael McDonald singing pre-record. And then this is in the morning on Letterman. Then they would segue live. The band would pick it up, hopefully seamlessly. And when I, when I got the job, they said, so of course you'll pre-record your theme and you'll seamlessly pick it up live. I said, well, wait a minute. I, I come from Saturday Night Live with, it's, if you want a live feeling, let me play it live. And I had to sort of talk them into it. But uh, by the time I was done, they did let me play it live. And we did. You know, it was a great way to start off. Much better than people listening to a tape for a while. So I have a question for both Tom and Paul, which is, you know, we have heard so many stories over the years about the camaraderie and the differences, perhaps, between the original cast of SNL. But Tom, maybe I'll start with you on this one. You know, what was it like working with somebody like Paul and the rest of the band? Was there any like, you know, are there some hidden gem stories there about like the camaraderie between the band members throughout the first few years that would be interesting for people to know? Because I'm sure you guys hung out all the time. Well, it was uh, nobody knew what the show was going to be. Uh, Saturday Night Live. Nobody really knew. I mean, I know a bass player friend of ours uh, turned the show down at first because, you know, Saturday Night Live, what a stupid name for a show, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> those, those of us who ended up on the show, uh, it was an, like an instant um, camaraderie. Everybody got along. And uh, it was a new, a new sound for television music. Prior to uh, th this show, late, late, late shows, late night shows were always big band. Go down the list of TV shows. Uh, and uh, so, uh, suddenly we have a rhythm and blues band as a house band for a network TV show. It was a whole new concept. And ever since Saturday Night Live started, all the new shows that have come on have been modeled after Saturday Night Live. You know, go down the list there, too. Were you going out together? Were you, like, hanging out oh, in yeah, New York City we, and stuff? Well, we, on Saturday, the show... The band started at 11 o'clock. You know, we had a sound check and a rehearsal, and, and then uh, we'd take a break around uh, one or so. And sometimes we had uh, some free time in the afternoon, so we would all, all hang out and, uh, you know, walk around the city. And uh, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was just a lot of fun. You know, everybody got along famously. Everybody was glad to have the gig, too. Uh, a lot of us that were studio musicians during the week, you know, suddenly we have a gig, a regular gig on Saturday, too. So not only are you working... Monday through Friday, doing uh, commercials and film and jingles, uh, 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 records. Uh, suddenly, we have this Saturday gig too. So it was, uh, uh, and it went from eleven a.m. to one a.m. for the band. It was a fourteen-hour stretch. So uh, anyway, we had a lot of fun. Good. One particular gentleman, uh, the late great Alan Rubin, who uh, he said, "You got to have a steak before you play." You need that in your stomach to back up, you know, the, the breath control. And so very often uh, we would all go out for, for a fast steak in between. Hurley's. Uh, Hurley's yes, very, the very often. But That's yes, so awesome. I mean, it, what, what Tom says is true. 11 a.m. was our call. 1 p.m. was our. I didn't leave. I, I understand. So would be, except for the get that steak. You know, I was kind of there all day <laughs> observing it. Some of the guys, I think, 
left. I heard a story, and, and this is funny because it's in some book. Oh, I can't remember where, but uh, after our time, maybe Tom was there when Sammy Figueroa. No, no, I think this was after Tom's time, too, when Tom MD'd it for a while. But then uh, there was a guy who used to, uh, G.E. Smith, when he had the, the band. Right, right. Uh, Sammy Figueroa was going to play conga, but he took another gig in between dress and air. <laughs> uh, Came back a little late, I think, and he had missed the thing. He wow. wouldn't like me telling the story, but I, every, everybody's still friends. Well, also, uh, Paul, Paul was um, not only a keyboard player in the band, but he was also uh, special music. Um, and what that means is, okay, you got a comedy routine, and it needs some... Uh, a, like a piano player to back up the funny lyrics or the whatever it is, uh, Paul would be there. So he sometimes couldn't leave in the afternoon because he had other things to do. And that's also, true. Sometimes I'd be involved in another in a sketch. Yeah, I was always trying to get on camera. You know, exactly. Uh, <laughs> and there were other. So, times, yeah, I, that's true. There were other times when, um, uh, let's say, we uh, the writers came up with something that needed uh, music. So uh, the writers would read through the script, and Paul would come in and play play along and uh you know i was a ranger for the show so i would take the tape home and and in in some cases write it out for the band you know based on paul's ideas yeah. so I was, by the way what you call it playing along i call it composing well, that, that's really <laughs> I, was, yeah. I was gonna say really, really, i was just playing along well paul see paul has a unique talent and this is uh, if on official paperwork uh canadian government he has a, a unique talent for combining comedy and music. I, that's, that's, that's right. That, that's how he got his citizenship, actually. Tom's uh, absolutely right. I, yeah. you, you had to you had to be bringing a unique talent to the U.S. Not not here to take away jobs from any, any U.S. musician. So I had to prove, you know, that I was bringing something unique. So Tom, right. going back to. Cool. You know, your master arranger, you know, and actually let's let's it's I don't want it to be lost on anyone. But Paul and Tom, you've had sort of like this symbiotic relationship yeah, on that's... two TV shows. Right. I mean, you know, Tom, you're just churning out music. Uh, and I do want to get to I know, John, and I want to get to some Letterman stuff. Uh, but first, uh, you know, some of my favorites, I think that you probably uh, wrote had to do with. um uh you know what was it like? I loved Chevy's girls. You know when the when the when the girls sang uh, Chevy Chevy. You know and kind of like that doo wop kind of style. And then of course King Tut, all that stuff. I imagine Tom, you had uh, arranged, yes, yes, yes. But I always uh, it was uh, a lot of times, like I said before, like it, it was Paul really composing in the rehearsal, and then I would take the tape home and and write it out, but. Uh, you know, a lot of it was really Paul's uh, genius, and I just sort of copied it and orchestrated it for uh, um, for the band. You flatter me, Tom. And we're talking <laughs> about che you know, Chevy. Uh, I love when you fall down. If that's genius, you know, I'll take it. <laughs> but that yeah, that was one of the ones that I wrote the melody for. Yes, Chevy's girls. Yes, uh, Chevy, that's so Chevy. great. <laughs> yeah, that's so right. Great. Exactly right. Uh, um, you know, we talked a lot about the the combination of music and comedy. And Paul, I mean, I think that the you know most SNL watchers would take away would be your work with Bill Murray on Nick the Lounge Singer. And you know, would love to hear a little bit more about that, the incarnations of how that started to develop, and your uh, camaraderie with Bill on producing that, not only during his time on SNL, but all the times that he came back to host and anniversary shows. You would do this with him is just fascinating. Oh, Star Wars. Well, <laughs> one of his big hit, one of his bigger hits. Yes. Well, I mentioned I mentioned his older brother Brian Doyle Murray, who was in Canada. He came up and and started with Joe Flaherty. Started a nightclub uh, review of the Second City, a version of the Second City nightclub review from Chicago. He cast people like Gilda and Danny and taught them how to improv in the Second City style. And while up there, I, I fell in with that Second City crowd and got to hang. We hit it off, Brian and I. I hung out with him incessantly. And he said to me, you know, your sense of humor reminds me of my brother, Bill. you got to see him. He does a funny thing that you would love, like a parody of Alan, Ross, Alan and Rossi, the old comedy team 
that we used to see on the Ed Sullivan show. And he does Steve Rossi, this super suave, straight man. Um, anyway, the next thing I knew, I was in New York. Brian introduced me around to, to uh, Belushi, uh, Doug Kenny, the famous uh, lampoon uh, writer, and um, also his brother, Bill, who had this character, the super smooth, overdone lounge type of guy. And the first time he did it was within a framework of a, a guy who was taking a shower and he had one of those shower mics. And he starts doing a show in the shower just to himself on the shower mic. And he brings in, here's my wife. She doesn't know she's having, an, I know that she's having an affair. Let's get her in here, you know. <laughs> and then he, the next thing was, I'm going to take that character, try him in a lounge. And I don't know, a group of about five of us fell together to put those things together. It, uh, one was myself and one was Bill. And then there was uh, Tom Davis uh, was always involved. And Marilyn Suzanne Miller was always involved. And I'm forgetting one other person. Um, but they would come up with these frameworks. And, if, and it, it, the guy was always named Nick. But if it was the summertime, he would be Nick Summers. And if he was at a ski lodge, he's Nick Winters, you know, or on the in the bar car on a train he's singing he's nick rails um and um i was in there you know uh helping to put together the stuff but the the ideas for what songs to do were always bills uh he just knew what he could do funny and you didn't question him you knew he was going to be funny um but a quick side note when i when i had my first meeting with dave letterman he said i saw you on that doing that bill murray stuff I have a feeling you had something to do with putting it together. And based on, based on that, he said he, he wanted to hire me and didn't ha never had anybody else in mind. Wow. That, so there you go. That's incredible. And ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first from Paul. <laughs> no, um, that's, that's, that's cool to hear. Hey, so Paul, uh, follow up from, from Nick, the lounge singer. Um, I remember the, well, We've seen uh, an iteration here on the 40th with Jaws, which we'll get to here in a minute, maybe. But the 25th anniversary was the cold open. I don't know if you remember. Uh, yeah. But Badlands, right? Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah. Badlands. And Bill, I don't know if you know, like I, I remember seeing this or reading this or hearing about it someplace, but Bill Murray talks about doing Badlands and singing the harmonies with Paul Schaefer as one of the highlights of his career. I think he. I think he. He said that in the uh, the first Saturday Night Live book, uh, written by the TV critic uh, Tom Shales and somebody else. And he said that. Yeah. He. Well. He. You know. Again. He brought in Badlands. Let's do it. And he did it all out. He was doing it almost. I mean, I remember I was playing. He was right here, his face. And <laughs> I looked at him, and he he thought he was Springsteen for a, for just a brief second. I think uh, he he certainly pours everything. He's got into it, whether it's comedy or drama or whatever. That that was an example. Well, and John, that's the same cold open, right? Where it's like in the year 2525, which, I mean, we're getting so close to like that whole, like if Lorne Michaels is still alive, there will be a Saturday Night Live and, and all that. I just it always kind of kind of got goosebumps. But oh, John's he did in the year 2525. Yes, he did that on the anniversary. I forgot that. And then right. he interviewed uh, Drew Barrymore. Remember, she was in the audience. And he said, let's <laughs> see that profile. He got her to show on his profile. Her profile. It, it, he, he, said, I, he says this. Do you guys remember this? He says, can we shut her mic off? Shut her mic off? We're so glad you cleaned up. Mic back on. <laughs> mic back on. <laughs> oh. Right. I remember that very clearly. And that, as far as Jaws, uh, that's what he did on the next anniversary, the most recent one. 40th anniversary. Right. And it's something that back in those in the day in the 70s, he was he was just sort of developing it. He would walk around singing Jaws, because that was the next, you know, there was an ET and Jaw, all of those kind of in a group. He was coming in for the last minute for that 40th anniversary. He didn't know what he was going to do. And it was Jim Downey, the famous writer who did most of the update writing eventually and uh, all the political stuff. He said, Well, Billy, if there if was ever a time to do Jaws. This is it. He remembered it clearly from back then. So did I. And that's how that's how it turned out that we did that one. That's amazing. Perfect. Do you have any uh, like thought in mind about what you might do for the 50th? Oh, my goodness. 
All I want to do is try to live that long. That, okay. That's okay. all I can say. All right. Sounds good. Well, we look forward to seeing it. Um, you know, one of the things I also want to ask you, Paul, is, you know, you're not only known for your time in the SNL band and working with Bill, but also a lot of people, uh, you know, may remember that you were actually a cast member on Saturday Night Live in season five of the show. Is that something that you wanted to do at the time? Did you enjoy it? I mean, that's pretty special that you are one of the cast oh, members. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I wasn't a, I was not a full fledged cast member. I was what you're they a call player. a feature Featured player, yeah. So kind of a supporting actor. You know you're going to be in, you know, so many out of the 22 or whatever, 13, however. And yes, I was, I was dying to get on camera, sneaking on however I could. And so, you know, when that came up, I, I loved to do it. I really only had one character, uh, Don Kirshner, the rock promoter. Uh, thank you for remembering. And, um, so I used to basically do Don Kirshner no matter what the character was. I I just do the same voice. Uh, but yeah, a lot of fun. Very, very, very much fun. One time, uh, Harry Shearer wrote me into a sketch where he was playing. Um, oh, he was playing Carl Sagan uh, in a parody of a show that was out at the time, Pink Lady. And I was playing Marvin Hamlish. But I was having such a good time on live TV with my friend that I started improvising as Hamlish and laughing kind of as Hamlish and laughing over his lines. A big no-no, you know, a terrible no-no that I, I certainly I learned my lesson. I don't think he's forgiven me yet, but I certainly learned my lesson. Well, Paul, in addition to uh, some of those... Uh... Well, I guess that's also a band apart, right? I'm thinking of the medieval band uh, and the, uh, you know what I'm going to say next, right? Yeah, again, a, again, a time when I got into trouble. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, you know, Franken and Davis were, were two write, write, writers and they came up with this idea to take the, there was an inside show business tape of the rock band, the Trogs trying to follow up their hit wild thing in the studio, but all they could do was profanities and say the F word. They didn't know any musical terms. All they knew was the F word. Franken and Davis took it, and instead of the trogs, they, they transposed it into medieval times. Tom, I think you were, were in that one too. Uh, I know James Taylor was in it anyway. And we made up our own word. We couldn't use the F word, so we say flog it. Flogging this, the flogging right. that, and it, right. it got big laughs in in um, in in rehearsal. And Franken said before the air show, he said, "You were doing so well. If you want to add a few extra floggings, go ahead." So it was really, you know, thinking about that, I just got a little too loose, and I said the actual F word, making history. And that's what Lorraine Newman, the first person to speak to me after it went down, I was in shock. Oh my God, my career is over. So Lorraine Newman says, uh, I'm white as a sheet. She comes over to me and says, well, thank you for making broadcasting history. And I just, <laughs> oh, my God. And then Lauren, the producer, came up and he said, well, you just broke down the last barrier. He was not upset because it was obvious that it was a, a legitimate mistake. And I think the bad English accents we were doing, nobody really noticed anyway. Yeah, let alone on the 100th episode of the show, which was a monumental uh, like uh, mark for the show. So it was pretty funny. That oh, that isn't happened that? Then. Oh, I didn't even realize that. But I now that you mentioned it, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Paul, can I also ask you, you know, you're asked to host Saturday Night Live. I believe it was in 1987. And you come back and you are the host of the show. What was that experience like, especially being with all of these new cast members or you have, you know, Dana Carvey and Phil Hartman, Jan Hooks, like all these legends eventually of the show and like all in sort of their infancy. How was that for you? It was fantastic. I mean, it was a dream come true. I went from writing special musical material to hosting it. It really was wonderful. I think the Letterman show was super hot at the time, you know, and so I got to do it. Lauren came back after some absence and maybe it was, you know, I don't know, whatever it was, the timing is right for me to do it. And yeah, I was like an old pro compared to these new young nervous kids. Um, but I ended with um, some special material, which in itself, Tom, it's funny you mentioned it. That's such an anachronism. Nobody knows what it means anymore. And Especially Cal Burnett, 
Yeah, oh. Carol Burnett used to say special material. The guy who wrote these special little songs. I didn't want to use that because I thought it was too Carol Burnett, you know. And so I, I made up a funny title. I used to have my credit used to say musical stylings until my musical mother stylings. said it. Yeah, my mother said, it sounds like you're doing their hair. So <laughs> I, I just went back to special musical material. Uh, wonderful. So I sang at the end of the song, you know, uh, uh, when I, in 1975, it was a very good year. A very good year. It, it was a very good year for something to, and brothers, Czech and blues, referring to the Czech brothers and the blues brothers. Billy did the news. Belushi chauffeur would drive because they all got limos, you know. Well, uh, in 1975, it was. Thanks for asking about that, though. A lot people of people don't, don't remember that. I remember I, that. I got to host it. Yes, yeah, it's true. It, well, it, and that musical tribute, John, was was really yeah. That it was. I think it was the last the last thing of the night, um, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Paul. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, it honestly, it's like tribute. it's one of those things. It's one of those things that's like really good trivia that I think that like nobody, you know, like a lot of people don't know, Paul, is like which member of the band in the history of the show went and then hosted Saturday Night Live. I mean, that's something that's just like a really cool fact. So I'm really glad we're able to get your perspective on that episode. Oh, ah, well, to thanks you. for asking. Yeah. Yes. Of course. Now yeah. let's save it, though. We got to save it for trivia contest. Exactly. Well, John, and do, John, do you remember? Of course you remember. I'm talking to John Schneider here, but like, the cold because everybody always puts Paul on this like hip pedestal, right? So it's like they had the cold opening, Dana Carvey and Nora and Don and John Lovett. So like they're concerned that this show is not hip enough <laughs> for, for Paul to come host it, which was awesome. Uh, yes, and I remember and part of it was I was on the phone with Letterman, wasn't that you know, yeah. supposedly in this Dave, they all, you know, I don't know, they're just not whatever it was Letterman said to me on Monday, it was so weird watching you and you're on the phone pretending to be talking to me and I'm watching it, you know, he, he, his mind was well, blowing a little bit. Well, I also and think, Tom, uh, James, sorry, I was going to say the, uh, I think at the good nights, Paul says, uh, we're going to see Letterman host in next week, which I think is a great line. And gets oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, that would have been great. But Hey, Tom, if, if you remember that particular, uh, episode or not, uh, as, as Paul said, yes, uh, David Letterman was extremely hot at the time. That Paul's appearance, Paul's hosting, wasn't that right around the fifth anniversary of Late Night with David Letterman? I think because it was it was broadcast. I think you guys taped it in eight H, but it was uh, broadcast like uh, a different day or something. That that sounds right because uh, Letterman started in uh, the late late show. Letterman started in eighty two, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's you, right. You, that's right. Paul just, Paul just got back to town and boom. Next thing you know, he's got a, a great band and a great show and a boom. So that Let was me, before Tom came aboard, though. That, that was in the 80s. I had that my four-piece band. I didn't come aboard I, until 93, if I remember correctly. Right. September 93. One real quick question, because, uh, Paul, I'm so glad you mentioned the musical tribute, SNL history, a very good year at the end of that episode you hosted. because. Um, I don't know, that kind of uh, is a pulling at your heartstrings moment. Now, this doesn't sound immediately like a pulling at your heartstrings moment when I mention Hugh Hefner, but I know that he uh, does the Thank Heaven for Little Girls as part of his uh, uh, his, his opening. Uh, but there's a, there's a story with uh, Hugh Hefner and uh, the great... Uh, Kathy, your wife, that that uh, is 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 part of this uh, this this whole scene. Is that correct? Well, I, yes, that's absolutely true. I guess that was in my book. But sure, after after Hefner hosted, there was a party at the Playboy Club. If you can imagine, they they still had Playboy clubs, and I went, and she was there, and that was the first night that I met her. But we didn't connect really that night, and we didn't connect until much later when Hal Wilner. The late great Hal Wilner, great Hal Wilner, who, who died of COVID right away when yeah. he, when uh, he he introduced Kathy and I again uh, a few months later. But the first time I actually laid eyes on her was at Hef's party. At Hef's party. Well, and I left out a part right because she sent you fan mail prior to that. 
Yes, I'm trying to get through this fast. I don't know why I'm embarrassed about it, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I love think, it. I think I think it's a great story. No, I think that you're right. I think I met her, but we didn't connect. I think she would probably say I was I was working on some other babe that I I saw there. I think, <laughs> uh, and she know I'm not telling tales. She knows that. But the, later she wrote me a letter. Hey, we went, we met at the Hefner party, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and then she had a, you know, and then Hal, it turned out we had a mutual friend. Uh, but with the story I like to tell, anyway, we got married happily ever after. We're 30 some odd years married now. Hugh Hefner, he sang Thank Heaven for Little Girls to open it up. Tom did the arrangement. Brilliant arrangement. Live television, we're all playing together, and he gets like three beats behind. And we're all looking at each other because there's nothing gets live. And he's three beats ahead of the band. And he didn't know. He just finished it that way. Anyway, the, 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 the uh, punchline is that he had his own special, the Playboy special, Playmate special or something. And he sings Thank Heaven for Little Girls. They did a ripoff of Tom's arrangement. And he goes out of time in exactly the same place. He sang it exactly wrong, <laughs> the same way. Yeah. The same I, way. He's obviously learned it from the show. <laughs> anyway, take this on <laughs> that was our, our fearless funny. leader, Hep. That's amazing. He studied the tape. He studied the tape. <laughs> he studied yeah. the tape and, and repeated the thing, repeated yeah. his, uh, his mistake. Did you want to yeah. tell them the story about, you told me a story one time, you were at University of Toronto, and this girl says, I want you to, to, to accompany me for an audition for a Broadway show. And you went in and you met three people that changed the rest of your life. Uh, well, that's absolutely, that's how the whole thing started. I mentioned that I had been in Godspell. Stephen Schwartz, the composer of Wicked, yeah. that was his first show. He was, a, Schwartz was a casting it. I played for a friend of mine, a song from his show. And he said, I want to talk to that piano player. He basically hired me that day to play the show up there. Five and years. in the show was Gilda Radner and Martin Short and Eugene Levy and Andrea Martin, maybe the funniest of them all, and Victor Garber. All these people in they, the same show. On the same all, day, you met, you met them on the same yeah. day. And we're all yeah. still incredible. friends. We're all still close friends. That's incredible. So, uh, Paul, Tom, I have some questions that some of our patrons sent in and these are our paid subscribers of the podcast that uh, are you know the best supporters of what we do here and they had a few questions for you guys so i'll just run through them let me start with uh, a question for tom okay uh this comes in from one of our patrons kaylee kaylee wants to know tom paul obviously hosted saturday night live once if you had been given the opportunity to host snl would you have done it of course why not okay um, all right He's great in the Blues Brothers movie, after all, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, well, um, so so. <laughs> I'd like to see Cropper and and Duck Dunn, the late Duck Dunn. I'd like to see them hosted together. Oh, that would be something. That yeah. would be all something. Right. Oh my God. All right. Let me ask this question from uh, Jeremy to Paul. Paul, Jeremy wants to know: Are you still watching Saturday Night Live today? Are there any sketches from recent times that you saw that really stood out to you, or any cast members that you really enjoyed seeing in modern times? Well, I watch it today the way the kids watch it. I watch the, the YouTube clips and the next day, and it's, I'm just uh, amazed that this thing that Tom and I were both together on show number one all those years ago is still so influential and as we saw just this last weekend they, they make and still people making big he big headlines yeah for sure well that that's awesome to hear and i'm sure that uh, a lot of the fans would be very appreciative to know that you're still keeping up with the show so that's uh really great so here's a question from one of our patrons uh curly joe curly joe wants to know paul what's it like to be a legend in both comedy and music well, first of all, Curly, I have enjoyed your work with the Three Stooges. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, it's very complimentary. I don't know about a legend or anything. I, I, I sure, sort of like Zillig, I, I did end up, you know, around a, a, a couple of happening things, Letterman Show and SNL. And I don't know, you know, timing is sure everything. And uh, you've got to be able to deliver. But, you know, getting the breaks is really all 
so much luck. You know, that story Tom mentioned about how I got hired in Toronto, and then that kind of led to me being in New York and led to me getting Howard knew I was here and all that stuff. Just sort of, I mean, amazing luck. That's all I can say, Carly. Awesome. All right. One more came in from uh, our friend Rusty Ralston. And Rusty wants to know, uh, this isn't as much of a question, Paul, about your time on SNL, but rather your time with Dave. Rusty wants to know, how was the transition from late night on NBC to the late show on CBS? So obviously, it's probably a loaded question, but the best you can to answer, Rusty. How was the transition? Oh, from late night to late show. Uh, yeah. um, well, you know, there was nothing like that late night, the first years of it when I, when I had just the four pieces and we could turn on a dime as soon as I had to expand it. And then I really, I needed Tom to write things out, you know, for the horns. But, but the show was uh, in its early days, so spontaneous. And I, I always refer to that time when they, when they, during the course of the hour, they turned the whole screen 360 degrees, totally around really slowly so that it, halfway through it was upside down. Uh, I don't think they would ever have done a thing like that on network. Once we hit 1130, it was like kind of the big time, you know, the audience, I think much bigger. And so, um, I don't know, maybe it was that where the show wouldn't take, didn't take the chances like it used to, maybe because the stakes were higher. So that's all I can say, you know, uh, and there's nothing like that 30 Rock. I loved that that building, a real broadcast building. They had to pour a lot of money into that Ed Sullivan Theater to make it broadcast worthy. And I still don't think it was the same as a real recording studio, a real television studio, I should say. That early band was a genius band. Uh, Will Lee on bass, Hiram Bullock on guitar, may he rest in peace. Uh, Steve Jordan on drums, who is currently with the Rolling Stones, the original drummer with the Blues Brothers. Uh, that band That's right. was incredible. Like Paul said, I mean, they could just turn on a dime. They could just listen to what's going on and just follow and, uh, um, you know, four, four geniuses at the same time. Amazing. I think that uh, now that you mentioned, I'm thinking that Steve Jordan, who we had, of course, in the Blues Brothers, first musician that we hired, because we hired every, each one of them sort of like they did in the, in the movie, one at a time. Uh, but I think that when we were playing that first Blues Brothers gig at the Universal Amphitheater, that that was when when Steve met Keith Richards for the first time. Uh, and so look at and look at what it ended, uh, how it ended up. Wow, P pretty cool, really cool. That's that's incredible. Uh, a question for both of you, back to the Letterman uh, days, uh, because I don't know who wants to take it, because one will maybe explain it the best but there was uh in one of the the latter years um towards the end of the run this atm joke right oh this is Where, tom's brilliant line right. that was my that was my 15 seconds i'll never forget it it was so funny um so was it, tom was you, it the you, dave? you start okay so dave, dave comes out from the monologue and he says uh a guy in kansas city was arrested yesterday for having sex with a cash machine. So, yeah. you know, we have a little intercom system with headphones and microphones, and, you know, and I, I told uh, Paul, I said he wanted to come into money and Paul stopped the show and gave Dave the line and, and the show stopped for a while. And uh, Dave was saying like, where were you at the meeting? You know, now that the, the band has to write the material for the show now, or, you know, and uh, he just went on and on, but uh, uh, that was my little 15 seconds of fame. They didn't stop the tape, though. All of that got on the, on the show. Really? And it was so really? funny. Yes, yeah. Dave was just, you know, I think they took all of that. Dave complaining and everything. He, he loved it, really. It was all fun. Am I, uh, yeah, am I? yeah well, uh, he came into some money, you said. And I said, oh, Dave, Tom just said something. <laughs> he came into some money. And that, yeah, basically stopped the show, except the tape kept rolling. And that, the, other, the, other, uh, the other 15 seconds I got was Dave goes outside, makes some snowballs, comes back in the studio and starts throwing them at the band. And I caught one of them in my baritone sax bill. And the, the still yeah. photographer, uh, John Philo, caught it. You know, I have a still of that, you know, that just. That's I got to get a copy of that. I got to get a copy yeah, of that. I'll find it and I'll send it to you. Cool. That's amazing.
Paul, what, what are you up to now? Like, are you doing anything that, uh, you know, the listeners would love to know what you've been doing and anything? You, you know, just a little, I'll, pl- yeah. I'll play the piano, who, whoever will let me. Okay. Uh, I've been doing some symphony work, uh, uh, which I've enjoyed very much. I've done four different symphonies so far. All pop stuff and R&B, like, like I like, but with a full symphony orchestra. And I hope to do more of that. I'm working on a... I may be booked a year from New Year's. Um, somebody, somebody tried to book me a year from New Year's. It reminded me of a story that Tom told me about a trombone player who gets a New Year's gig, and after it's over, the employer says, you guys were great. I want to book you next, next New Year's. And the trombone player says, great, can we leave our stuff? That's the, way I, <laughs> that's the sort of the way I felt of working on a, a gig a year from now. Okay. Anyway, well, other, otherwise, I'm uh, I'm I'm available for hire. Okay, good to know. Maybe maybe we'll get you to compose a new uh, new track here for us for our intro. So <laughs> I, I'm your man. I'm your man. I like what you got though. I heard what you opened with. I've been All doing. Right, well, I, thank you. I would stay with that. Okay. I've been doing. Sounds good. I've been doing pop symphony myself. I did uh, did one in Thunder Bay where Paul's from. I did one at University of North Texas, uh, uh, Hastings, Nebraska. Where was the other one? Southern Miss, but. Um, uh, you know, it's it's all pop R and B stuff where I just play the melody, and I uh, played a big fundraiser at North Texas State at the big place, and they uh, it was a fun. And so the at after party, this lady's patron lady says uh, she liked the music, and I say, well, did you recognize any of the songs I played? She says, I knew the words to every song. Hmm, so okay. and that's kind of the target audience, you know, people. That, yes, no wonder she enjoyed you. Just playing the melody to nice nice songs and. Uh, uh, symphony orchestra with rhythm section, similar similar to Paul's act. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And Tom, do you have anything coming up that you want to plug to the listeners? Oh wow! Uh, I, it's a long list. I'm playing jazz festivals all over the place. Uh, six days from now, I'm playing in, in Indianapolis with five uh, high school jazz bands. Wow! I'm not sure, I'm not sure exactly where, but um, uh, uh, maybe James knows. Um, uh, Noblesville, uh, Noblesville High School. Nobleville High School, yes, and it's yep. on it's on Monday night. Uh, this coming okay. Monday night, yes, flying in, and then, um, uh, and then I'm playing. Uh, I'm playing with uh, Chess Fever, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, on the West Coast. It's a Last Waltz cover band. I, I never would have. Yeah, I was I in a figured. movie called The Last Waltz. I, I, I you went sure were. 1976. I uh, summer of '76. I went on the road with a group called The Band from Woodstock. I don't know if you guys. Some of us. Band. Some of us remember them. Course, and, we, yeah. and we remember your bright red jacket in, that you wore in the last waltz, too. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yes. And so so uh, uh, we're playing in uh, North Hollywood uh, a week from Friday. And then we're playing in San Diego on Saturday. And we play in uh, someplace else between L.A. and uh, and San Diego on Sunday. So uh, that's... Um, uh, I'm that's, tired. Just I'm tired just hearing of your schedule. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm going to have to take a nap. I'm telling you. Well, I, I, Tom, I'm going to take you to lunch when you're out here. But let me just quickly say this, interject, uh, John, if you don't mind, uh, to both Tom and Paul, um, on behalf of all the musicians and music educators out there, you guys especially, you know, going back during the shutdown during COVID and, and, and for, for years, though, you have been, both of you have been um, making music advocacy and arts advocacy part of your 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 mission and your 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 uh, prioritization of just how it's important to make sure that it shows up in schools and that you're supportive of that uh, means all the world to to those of us in the in the music education world. So thank you for that uh, and encouraging people to keep playing uh, means so much. I wanted to plug one more quick thing. Uh, I've been playing in the last six years. I've been playing with Gary Sinise, Lieutenant Dan Band. <laughs> Gary Sinise, you know, he was in a movie called uh, Forrest Gump, where he was a a veteran who lost his legs. So uh, after the success of the movie, Gary got an award from the uh, Disabled American Veterans, the DMP, uh, DAV. And uh, so uh, a little bell went off in his head. Before he was an actor, he was a musician. He was a bass player in a band in Chicago. So uh, before he and John Malkovich started the Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago, just north of the Loop, and uh, so he formed this band and started entertaining the military. And he formed a foundation where people could contribute to 
make the band happen. And uh, I've been playing with them for about the last six weeks, last six years, excuse me, last six years. We've hit every major military base in the United States, including Fort Buchanan in Puerto Rico and uh, Guantanamo Bay. Wow. No place you want to go. But wow. Yeah. So I've been I've been doing that. My 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 own father survived Pearl Harbor. So I understand uh uh you know uh PTSD and all that stuff uh firsthand. So uh I'm proud to say that I'm playing with Gary and he's doing Good the right you. thing. That's incredible. Really Thank, cool. Thanks for sharing that with us, uh Tom. Um, Paul, Tom, if you don't mind, I'll just take uh, one moment just to wrap up the podcast. And uh, on behalf of all of our listeners, just really want to thank you too for your stories and continuing to, uh, Tom, for your second time here joining us with more of them. And Paul, great to hear from you. What a legend. So uh, thrilled to have you on the show with us. And for all the listeners who are joining us right now, we're between our Dave Chappelle coverage on Saturday Night Live and our Kiki Palmer coverage coming up the first week of December. So very excited. Lots of really fun uh, discussions that we had about these episodes. So I'm very excited to have done that. We just did a Thanksgiving special with our super fans and coming up next Monday. Uh, you guys will remember this. We have something on our network called Point Counterpoint, which was a fun thing that we took from the original days of SNL, where we do a little SNL debate show. So that's coming up on Monday with Andrew Dick and tj randall so i hope you'll join us for that next monday but uh james such a pleasure to be with you today thanks for everything that you do for snl stories so happy to have you on uh my pleasure uh looking forward to seeing tom perform out here soon and if we ever do a a part two with paul schaefer we can hear more about uh him and richard dreyfus uh performing i want to be seduced maybe and more about that kiss from uh b arthur after uh let me love you, and we'll dig into it's raining men probably. But uh, wow. <laughs> so much. sounds like a guess. <laughs> so much. Thank you, right? guys. Thank, thanks for having us, Tom. Thanks for getting me on. Thank yeah, you. of course. Th- thanks. It's nice hanging out with all you guys. On behalf of Paul and Tom and James here from the Saturday Night Network, my name is John. Thank you for joining us today. We will see you next time, everybody. Have a good one.